<laughs> Things aren't always what they seem. Here at Wicked Binge, all of our viewers get a fast pass to the action. That is, if you're ready to learn about some of the absolute wildest theories, rumors, and straight up conspiracy theories the House of Mouse has to offer. I'm Keefe Nosy with Wicked Binge, and this is Disney Urban Legends, fact or fiction. Today, we'll be talking about specifically the Disney Animation Studios and the beloved movies and characters therein. No Pixar today. There's no shortage of crazy myths and hidden secrets to go around though, so if this leaves you craving more like Pooh Craves Honey, let us know. Now, what are we waiting for? Let's get rolling. Well, we've mentioned him already, so why not kick it off with Winnie the Pooh and Psychological Diseases 2? Oh, you don't remember that spinoff? Well, this isn't exactly the Book of Pooh. It's more like the Canadian Medical Association Journal. Sarah Shea, Kevin Gordon, and other doctors researched the world of Winnie the Pooh back in 2000 to help illustrate mental illnesses in a simple way. Or maybe just because they thought it would be funny. Either way, this is a pretty popular theory. To the point where there's even a whole test around it on the IDR Labs website to tell you which character resonates with your cognitive dysfunction the most. Pooh Bear and Tigger are ADHD, Piglet is anxiety, Eeyore is depression, etc. This is certainly a true theory in so far as it's backed up by legitimate scientific research by medical professionals, and we're certainly not able to debunk the validity of the information provided here, since, you know, they're the doctors here, what the hell do I know? There are countless examples of the characters' behaviors exhibiting their respective illnesses, like Tigger's excessively impulsive behavior or Rabbit's obsessive need to organize everything around him, Oh dear. Oh. or Eeyore being Eeyore, so it doesn't take a medical degree to see the validity of these claims. But while this theory may be true, it's not intentionally true. In 1926, when A.A. Milne started work on the Winnie the Pooh series, many of the aforementioned illnesses were hardly researched, some being first diagnosed as late as the 1980s. As much sense as it makes, it's really just an example of the lovable characters having more lessons to teach us as we get older, this time about psychology. Speaking of psychology, someone really needs to call a therapist for Aladdin. If he actually said this, there's no shortage of supposed subliminal messages in Disney films, and this isn't the only one we'll be talking about, but it's definitely one of the strangest. Tune in with us to this scene from Disney's Aladdin, featuring a line that's anything but family friendly. So how's our little bow doing? Uncle Mouse. Let's get it. Come on, good kids. Take off the This is one of those weird, unclear voice clips that seems to be perpetually misheard. Most people hear this line of Aladdin as good teenagers take off your clothes. But while you might think Herbert the Pervert managed to sneak into the writer's room for a moment, don't worry. Disney denied claims that they'd put such a dirty line in a kid's film, asserting that the actual line was good kitty take off and go. That's that's awful. It's still such a mesmerizing detail though. On one hand, of course a family movie like Aladdin wouldn't have such a nasty line in it. But on the other, even listening multiple times, it's pretty hard to hear this clip as the intended line. Still, the supposed subliminal message makes no sense in context since he's talking to a flying carpet, yet it also makes Jasmine's reaction after the line really funny. The line was changed in the DVD release to a simple down kitty, so it's at least certain they were aware of this and probably didn't mean to put it in. Here's hoping that no hormonally stressed out teens took Aladdin's misheard words to heart in the theaters. Not today, Herbert. Don't worry though, the next sexually explicit subliminal message goes from unintentional to only half intentional. This is the Lion King sex scene. What? No, no, not an actual sex scene. No, this is a PG channel, PG-13 at most. So this scene is within our bounds, surely. It's just a silly little group of pixels that looks like it spells out the word sex. Now, there are plenty of small misinterpreted details in kids' movies that parents will complain about, but what if we told you this was technically intentional? Well, the plant matter forming letters was, anyway. It was meant to spell SFX, as in sound effects. I guess it could be special effects, whatever. The idea of sex as a hidden word is incredibly strange and rather inappropriate, obviously, but it's at least funny in an absurdist way. The SFX snuck in was meant to be an Easter egg by the film's special effects team. So special effects does make more sense. Well, yeah, so the whole thing was at least kind of cute. The fact that there are so many of these weird unintentional subliminal messages that always get fixed in later releases begs the question of whether Disney's doing this on purpose to keep things mysterious in their movies so that there's always one more Easter egg to be discovered. And remember, it's our little secret. Or maybe we just all think way too hard about cartoons, but hey, that's kind of our job, as long as we're all having fun, right? Speaking of fun, it seems like Snow White was having a little too much fun with the seven dwarves, or should we say Crack White and the seven symptoms? Yes, this theory states that Snow White is actually about cocaine and its effects. There are lots of interesting observations with this one. Snow, for instance, is one of the street names used for crack, and Snow White herself could very well be the crack that the dwarves are addicted to. Thank <laughs> you. 
They do absolutely adore her after all, and according to this theory, each one is named after a symptom of coke usage. From the short temper of grumpy to the side effects of sneezy and sleepy to... Come on, do we even have to clarify dopey? Dopey, that said, this is a pretty unlikely theory, on an intentional level at least. In the original German fairy tale, Snow White was called that because her skin was just that white. We're not saying it's impossible that she's that white because of how much crack she's been doing, but it seems like more of a funny coincidence, akin to that Spongebob theory about the characters being based on the seven deadly sins. It's a neat conspiracy theory, but it's 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 just that, a conspiracy theory. We'd rather draw your attention to Lightning McQueen straight up confirming that he's a metaphor for speed. It's, it's like his first line. I am speed. But maybe we aren't ready for that conversation today. All right, we're a little late to the party on this next theory, but as a late Pride Month present, let's discuss Li Shang by Con. Before Disney had a decent amount of LGBT characters like Luz from the Owl House, gay characters in pretty much anything were few and far between, considering how taboo of a subject it used to be. That said, Mulan might have actually had one of the earliest examples of one, for those unaware. The film is about Mulan, who disguises herself as a man so she can fight in the place of her father in the war to defeat the Huns. She catches feelings for Li Shang, quite understandable. Just look at that sheer manliness. <laughs> uh, anyway, even during Mulan's time as Ping, Li Shang seems to be falling for her despite fully believing that she's a he. Fans point out that he gives her the same look when she's Ping that he eventually does when he forgives her for the deception. BD Wong, Li Shang's voice actor, also commented in 2021 on the matter, asserting that he believes him to be sexually fluid. We might not know whether or not this was an intentional representation, and it's honestly very unlikely given Disney's track record and the social stigma of the time, but quite literally every other piece of evidence points to this theory being true. That's right. Li Shang, more like Ba, ba sh Bi Shang. That one really works better in text than speech, huh? All right, I can deny it no longer. There's no more avoiding the Disney multiverse theory. This is almost undeniably the most well-known, widely believed theory about the Disney movies. It states that most movies in the Disney continuum take place in the same universe, including Pixar. This theory is popularized by the sheer amount of Easter eggs for other movies in the various films. DisneyTheory.com user Joshua wrote a blog in 2013 about 30 Disney movies sharing the same universe, citing a lot of Easter eggs that back up the theory. For an even greater piece of evidence, look no further than Wreck-It Ralph 2, which has a scene of Vanellope meeting the Disney princesses on the Oh My Disney website, which would seem to imply that the Disney princesses actually know each other and hang out on occasion. This is just one of many examples, like the rescuers having a cameo of Bambi's mother drinking water from a ravine, or the genie pulling Sebastian out of his bag of tricks in Aladdin. We'd be here all day if we went through every one of them, so just know that this theory is almost certainly true. Now that Marvel is a Disney property, maybe we'll see a Disney Endgame-esque movie one day. Oh, they've got Fox too, so maybe we'll finally get a Peter Griffin, Spider-Man, Winnie the Pooh crossover, like I've always dreamed of. Okay, maybe we ought to reel it in a little bit. Enough fun and games. It's time to get darker than a head of raven hair. We now travel to Paris to talk about its fearful villain, Claude Frollo, and his last Last chance at redemption. Few Disney villains have struck a chord quite as well as Frollo. This man is everything that exemplifies what a God-fearing man should never be. Well, no matter. I'm sure you'll whip my men into shape. From killing Quasimodo's mother, who was only seeking sanctuary, to sheltering Quasimodo and belittling him at every turn. This guy's no Ned Flanders. Excuse me. Needless to say, he's one of Disney's most vile antagonists, but if nothing else, his villain song was absolute fire. Fittingly, really, it's literally called Hellfire, and it doubles as a fantastic song and a prayer to God pleading to relieve his feelings for Esmeralda. That is, by, you know, smiting her. How dare she be so darn gorgeous? Destroy her for this! I mean, it's surely not his fault, if in God's plan he made the devil so much stronger than a man, right? We could go on all day about everything there is to take away from Frollo's character in this song, like the prayers of reverent saints possibly reflecting his truthful realization of his own fault. But there's one moment that's particularly interesting. Before the final verse of the song, an unnamed associate of Frollo's comes into the room to tell him that Esmeralda has escaped, effectively answering Frollo's prayer that he'd be rid of her. It's been said before, from YouTube comments to discussion forums, that this man is meant to be a representation of God himself, giving Frollo one final chance to put this all behind him. It fits well with Christian doctrine, which centers on religion, and it also cements Frollo as the dastardly villain of the story, given that he only desires to either take Esmeralda or kill her, no compromises. We could really analyze this song and this character all day, but may God have mercy on us, we still have some more entries to discuss here. That's not our fault though. A bit more on the wholesome, respectful of women's side, we have Beauty and the Beast's feminist agenda. With how often women were treated exclusively as eye candy or damsels in distress, especially before the 21st century, it's understandable that independent female characters were in high demand, and this sentiment didn't go unnoticed by the mouse. A CBR article by Brian Cronin goes into detail on the origins of Beauty and the Beast, and how it wouldn't be the movie we know 
into love today without Disney chairman Jeffrey Katzenberg. Noting criticisms of Ariel in The Little Mermaid having little autonomy as a character, Katzenberg checked out the Beauty and the Beast adaptation well into its production and had it scrapped for making Belle too much of a typical goody two-shoes princess. We can't blame the former screenwriter Richard Purdom for quitting, we honestly would be pretty ticked too, but all of our respect goes to Linda Wolverton, who took the role of main screenwriter and revamped Belle into an independent, smart heroine who wanted to make her own decisions, one who wanted more than just a brutish Hulk-like Gaston. Imagine how much more boring and downright sad the movie would have been without it. Oh, of course, Gaston, dear. Let me make you a sandwich to feed you before you go kill that awful no-good beast. Kudos to you on this one, at least, Disney. But what Disney conspiracy theory discussion would be complete without any mention of its beloved mascot, Suicide Mouse? Oh, y you know, Suicide, short for Mickey. Okay, seriously, though, who else remembers when creepypastas about lost episodes of beloved kids' shows were absolutely taking you to by storm? I'm not the only one who got traumatized with some of those, right? Well, whatever. One of the most terrifying examples of it is the Suicide Mouse.avi story. We're not going to show the actual video here, but long story short, it was supposedly a lost episode of Mickey Mouse from the early 1930s, which seemed to just be a bunch of cheap walk cycles. But according to the story, after a minute and a half, the screen goes black, only to get right back to the cycle, now distorted with horrific screams of terror on the side. Thankfully, and rather unsurprisingly, it's not real. Well made though it may be, the lack of resemblance to other Mickey Mouse cartoons of the era helped assure viewers that it wasn't legitimate. It did kick off most of those lost episode creepypastas though, which, well, whether that's good or bad, we'll leave up to you guys. But really, you owe us for going through this one for you. Seriously, suppress that memory for a reason. All right, how about this? We'll call it even if you humor us on this last conspiracy theory. And yeah, it's a goofy one. No, not the character goofy. We're going to wrap things up by talking about Frozen. No, also not the movie. This is less of a cinematic Frozen and more of a cryogenic Frozen. This refers to an absolutely wild conspiracy theory stating that after Walt Disney's death in 1966, he had his body cryogenically frozen to be brought back to life once technology would enable such a feat. Great, I could use a drink. Patrick Hicks, head of legal at Trust and Hill, took the time to gather information for the theory, so it's only right for us to show our appreciation and use it, right? We'll lead with the same conclusion Hicks drew in the article. According to Disney's death certificate, he was cremated just two days after his passing. You'd think that's the end of it, but there's always more than just surface level. Many books shelled out ludicrous claims about Disney and his fascination with cryonics and his strong desire to preserve his body after death, one example being from Mark Elliott, author of the biography Walt Disney, Hollywood's Dark Prince, who asserts that Disney developed a growing preoccupation with his own immortality. Family members denied all such claims. His daughter Diane doubted that he even knew what cryonics were, let alone that he'd have a burning desire to be a test subject for them. Still, it's possible that such authors are desperately trying to convey the truth to the masses. And of course, if anyone were going to cover for Walt, it'd be his family. The movie Frozen is thought to be a cover-up to distract from the actual Frozen animator among us. All concrete evidence points to this being a Dale Gribble level conspiracy theory, but we're not counting it out. If it is true after all, we'll only know in the distant future. Will Walt Disney be the surprise tool that can help us later? Find out whenever he inevitably comes out of the freezer to do something. Just you wait. I...